Very good. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Committee of the Whole for May 25th, 2022 uh, at 7.07 p.m. Uh, first order of business is Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, and the Republic for which it stands, for which it stands one nation, under God, nation, indivisible, indivisible liberty, justice for all. liberty, justice for all. All right, we'll move on to our roll call. Alder Allen is absent with excuse. Uh, Alder Arata Frada is also absent with excuse. Alder Gerhardt. Here. Alder Herbst. Here. Sorry, Scott, wasn't in the mic. <laughs> Alder Maldonado. Here. Mayor Richardson. Here. Alder Strassman is absent with excuse. Alder Udell. Here. Alder Wheeler. Here. You have a quorum. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to the next item, approval of minutes. Uh, the minutes for April 27th, 2022, draft minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? I move, move approval. Second. Motion made by Alder uh, Herbst, seconded by Alder Gerhardt. Discussion? Hearing none, we'll place the motion to a vote. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it, motion carries. Uh, next item, public appearance is for non-agenda items. We have no one in chambers or on Zoom. We will move on to the agenda for the evening. Uh, agenda, agenda items, 6A, Fitchburg Chamber, Visitor Business Bureau and Destination Madison. And we have a number of folks here representing. And Angela Kinderman, hey, welcome. Everyone. Thank you. And I, w when it's appropriate, I'll let you introduce the others. Okay, great. Right. Very good. <laughs> so Thank we you. are, I'm here representing the Fitchburg Chamber Visitor and Business Bureau. Um, we are Fitchburg's tourism entity in addition. So our organization has the Chamber Department and then what we're, I'm here to talk about tonight at the Tourism Department. Um, you can, should, go ahead. Should I just, is there a special sign for slide advance? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so who we are, what we do, we are um, the, a visitor bureau for Fitchburg. We strengthen the brand of Fitchburg and our work, we work to attract visitors and uh, travelers, businesses, families to Fitchburg to increase tourism revenue and stimulate the economy. <clears throat> Room tax is intended to provide, this is kind of a higher level overview, intended to provide revenue for tourism and promotion development. Um, we, in order to do that, we provide information, services, marketing, leisure to travel to consumers in the following ways. We serve as the Visitor Bureau, um, build relationships and support programming that make an economic impact in our community. So years ago, um, or not too many years ago, but when uh, Fitchburg engaged in a strategic plan for the, our local economy, Forward Fitchburg, many of you participated in that. Um, in the tourism section, the areas that we wanted to focus on were three different areas, and so we work with brand extension, corporate development, and leisure development. So brand extension, of course, is letting people know uh, where Fitchburg is, who Fitchburg is, and what we have to offer. We do this in a variety of ways. These are just a few, some of the marketing um, materials or campaigns that we participate in. You're probably familiar with the Welcome to Fitchburg Guide. We, we distribute 18,000 copies of that each year. Um, the Bike the Berg maps are very popular. Our City in Motion video, if you haven't seen it, is also quite popular. Um, not only do we use it, but different companies and organizations use it for marketing purposes. Um, we have uh, over 4,000 monthly subscribers to our Visit Fitchburg newsletter. If you have, do not receive that, I would really recommend it. It's a really nice monthly update on events and activities in Fitchburg. And of course, a lot of different um, campaigns and our presence in social media and traffic, obviously that's most important. We've had a great increase in the last 18 months in both of those areas. So. These are just a few of the um, 
different online and or print publications or outlets that we work with to promote Fitchburg activities and events. Come, you know, when you take a look at the kind of our total reach, um, when you add in all those different areas that we participate in that we make sure Fitchburg events or activities are, are being promoted, that's the kind of reach we have. Um, a lot of it is local, Dane County area, but then we do also have some kind of the, which I'm sure Destination Madison will talk about, kind of the five state region, which is kind of our drive time travel. Um, we, we were able to make an impact there. So corporate development is what we considered the um, corporate travel. Kind of took a hit the last couple of years, but I'm happy to say that, that is coming back. Um, two of our signature, not our signature events, but Fitchburg signature events produced by Promega and the Biopharmaceutical Technology Center, the Stem Cell Symposium and the International Forum on Consciousness. They are back in person this year, so we're always happy to have those visitors. Um, and then we are getting calls and have worked with a couple of different associations already this year in conference planning. Um, in fact, one of them was our own, I got to work with our chief, Joe. Uh, he brought the fire chiefs from across the state to Fitchburg for a few days. And so we were able to plan a nice itinerary for that group. So um, that kind of travel is coming back and we're, we're happy to work with them. Um, not only just for hotel bookings, but we provide kind of a event planner service, concierge service to event planners, helping them with itineraries that would achieve their goals and, and make their customers happy in Fitchburg. Some other things that we might do in that corporate development area, we provide marketing and design assistance to CETA when they need um, marketing materials or ads or other things that they participate in. I think this was in the uh, Thrive publication. So we, we um, our marketing team helps them with that. That's it. The last thing I will say before we move on to leisure is the corporate development. If you participate or are in an association and you want to bring a meeting or conference here, I would encourage you to have um, those event organizers contact us to help them out. And then leisure development is really kind of what um, we most of us think about with tourism, the fun stuff, travel, um, events, Sporting events in particular are really popular. That's probably, I would say, 70% of our work is the leisure development. So we, we have our hands in a little bit of everything with that. We might provide sponsorship dollars for support. We might actually produce the events ourselves, or we might um, assist with all of those things in staff time for different events that take place in Fitchburg. Um, we also work with uh, especially youth sports, and I, we had a really nice um, partnership this year with the Verona Chamber, and we were able to um, get the contracts for MESA, the Madison Area Youth Soccer Tournaments that take place at Redden Park. And so um, those contracts had previously not been in Fitchburg and Verona, but we thought this worked out really well, and I think it'll work well for the um, travelers that come for those tournaments. So that was a nice... So a nice partnership with a neighboring community that I think will pay off for, for the visitors. Um, and of course, the Fitchburg events, we're just constantly promoting Fitchburg events. We have some really nice Fitchburg events, all of which you're probably familiar with. Um, kids Building Wisconsin was just last week. I think they had about 4,000 people, parents and kids. What? Oh my gosh. <laughs> 7,000 people. Oh, wow. That's a lot of kids. Um, Festa Italia is next weekend, um, not this Memorial weekend, but the following weekend. Jazz at Five is, uh, was new to Fitchburg last year. They are hosting three events at the top of State Street this year and then three concerts at McKee Farms Park again in August. Uh, concerts at McKee, of course, the beloved concert at McKee begins in June and uh, we just had off the charts attendance last night or last year. Uh, really, really great event. Agora Art Fair, uh, I think we're in our 12th or 13th year of the Agora Art Fair, another uh, signature event for us. Fitchburg Festival of Speed is in July. That is the host of the Wisconsin State Criterium Championship. Uh, there will be live music there and fireworks. If you haven't been to that event, I really encourage you, especially maybe to come out at the end for the championship race and then fireworks and, and music. And a new one this last year was Hop House Run. That was really uh, kind of off the charts popular and I think it'll continue to grow. So some, a lot of stuff going on. 
Um, just a reminder, we serve as uh, kind of the visitor center and can assist people in a variety of ways. And then, you know, our, one of our uh, most important parts of our work is the partnerships that we create. We have partners here tonight, Destination Madison. Uh, we work with Travel Wisconsin, which is the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. Obviously, we're in touch quite a bit with our Fitchburg Hotel properties, helping them where we can, looking at where the gaps are in their marketing needs or times that we can help. Um, race day events, so Fitchburg business here, obviously a lot of work, we work with them. And then, of course, our Bike Fitchburg, which is a nonprofit bike advocacy group in this, in this community. So that was kind of the speed round. We've got our hands in a little bit of everything. And um, if you have any specific questions, I am happy to answer them. Yes, Mayor Richardson, go ahead. Could you just speak maybe to the where we at for bouncing back from COVID? I know that really had a huge impact on the organization and events and things like that. Can you speak to kind of where we are? Yeah, just in, you know, just in terms of dollars, and I, you guys probably get those numbers too, we're, I think the last quarter we were at about 80% in revenue from where we were in 2019. Everybody compares to 2019, right? Um, so that's revenue-wise. Event-wise, you know, that came back with a bang last summer. And I, I remember last year at this time we still didn't know if we were going to be hosting concerts and festival of speed and stuff, but then we were able to and attendance was off the charts. And in addition to just those bigger events, you've probably noticed a lot of different activities in Fitchburg, uh, live music, bingo, trivia, you know, a lot of different. So people are really, really eager to get together and have some fun. Does that answer your question? But in, in terms of building back organizationally, we're, we're getting there, but then just in terms of the customer and the hotels there, the, I'd say the, um, and, and I'm sure Destination Madison will speak to this more specifically, but ha talking to the hotel properties, the leisure travel and especially the, the youth sports travel is back close to where we were pre-COVID. The um, corporate travel is where we're still going to be doing some building, yeah. which probably makes sense. Very good. Yes, uh, Alder Herbs, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. You have yes. the floor. Um, do you uh, uh, have you uh, worked with Discover Wisconsin to see if they do a, f a feature on Fitchburg? You know, possibly in the fall. You know, include Apple Garden or you know our pickleball courts. Uh, is that I don't know how they how they pick the places they're going to go. Do you do you have um, to? Uh, they pick the places with the biggest. Checkbook. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> All right. Enough said. I don't, I don't want. To no, no. But we okay. actually have worked with them in the past, Dave. And um, it was oh, I, I, I can't remember the year. I'm going to say 2017, maybe. We did a, a feature with them, a biking feature, and it was really, they did a really good job. Um, I think they've changed a little bit organization-wise since okay. then. But I can even share that with you, Dave. I think we have a copy still. But. Um, it's not something to rule out for sure. They, it's a, it's a marketing avenue. But that would is, explain why they're in Lake Geneva quite often. It, right? it is a, a pay-to-play <laughs> marketing Thank avenue. You. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> yes, Alder Gerhardt, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, hi, as, uh, nice to see you. Hi, Gabriella. Person. Uh, I'm curious about, like, so when you're doing your concierge services and you obviously have these people coming in from elsewhere, they've mm -hmm. never been to Fitcher before, is there some s certain amenities or certain types of businesses that are not here that you end up having to refer them to, you know, to somewhere in Madison or somewhere elsewhere that we'd be interested mm. in sort of attracting to Fitchburg? Oh, well, I've got a whole list of businesses. <laughs> yeah, Mike and I have a long list of businesses we like here, but no, I mean... That, I haven't experienced that when we're working with conferences or tournaments. You know, there's um, especially what we try to do is understand what the goal, like what the, their customers want. Do they want to walk when they're here? Do they have transportation? Those type of things. And then, you know, because we have kind of hotels on different sides of the corridor, we try to match them up with that and then are able to work with like our restaurants. Um, in terms of like events and activities, we Typically, I haven't run into something where we couldn't provide them that service here in Fitchburg. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, we don't have a 500-person ballroom, that, that whole conversation, but 
when, when, we, when they've decided on this location, we were usually able to get them what we need. And the fire chiefs, I think, had a great time, so. <laughs> Mayor Richardson, you had a question. I just want more quick one, easy one. So Kids Building in Wisconsin had like 7,000 people here. What are, what, is the biggest, what are the biggest events in Fitchburg? It's gotta be up there. I don't know, Burby well, Derby's probably up a, there. For a one day, seven hour event, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, I know the um, art fair would be another one that's up there. Yeah, the art fair, you know, pre-COVID we were like, it was close to 15,000. Again, for a one day event, that's a pretty nice number for Fitchburg. Um, so I would say the art fair is probably still, but that's, a, that's amazing. The Kids Building Wisconsin does a great job organizationally and transportation wise and so. Burby must be up there, I would think. Um, Burby what's Derby? that, Burby Derby for sure, yeah, yeah. All right, very good, any uh, additional questions? Uh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Do you make an effort to support businesses by, you know, underrepresented groups, minority-led or, or women-owned or? Um, through the tourism department? Yeah. Um, we certainly would. I mean, we use, we, we certainly try to use Fitchburg First businesses for, say, like, vendors or concerts or stuff like that. Um, concerts at McKee has one of our intentional goals was to make sure that, and if you haven't been to the concert at McKee, I think you'll see, I'm, I think it's a really nice representation of our community in terms of all ages, all races, all genders. In terms of business support, I'd say maybe our chamber maybe is more, you know, is, we're, we're more engaged in programming with the chamber with that kind of work. Does that make sense? Yes. Or is there a specific no, kind of No, just in general, like okay. the, the efforts in relation to yeah. kind of representation, broadening representation. I, I think one of the biggest things that we keep in mind with representation, at least in our community, is, is can we can we do some of the things we do event-wise in other areas of the community? So there's McKee Farms Park, which, you, you know, you can't beat that in terms of its facilities and space and stuff like that. But, um, you know, we're, we are always looking for opportunities to maybe be in, a, in different areas or, um, even concert series in different parks, that type of thing. So that's something we haven't pulled off yet with kind of resource wise, but it might also be something we could partner with other groups on too. It would be interesting to know if there's like a particular, like as we're building a new park, mm -hmm. like what types of things are required in order. I'm sure this is like a conversation, but like for, for, for me, I'm sure that this is known, but as a council member, it's interesting to know kind of if we're gonna attract a, a big event to a certain part of town what do we need to, yeah. to provide in order to make sure that we're bringing it to other parts besides just, I mean, yeah, Bikir Farms Park is great, but it's, this is a big city, so yeah. 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 Great, thanks. Very good, uh, no other questions. We will move on to uh, uh, Destination Madison. Yep, so I mentioned our partners at Destination Madison. So tonight here we have the um, CEO and president, Ellie Westman Chin. Um, Jamie Patrick, who is, I hope I get this right, you guys, Vice President of Sports Marketing and Development. Convention Sales. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Kate Dale, who is the Marketing Director. So I'll let you guys. Very good. Yeah. In there. Great. Thank you, Angela. Welcome. Thank you so much. And good evening, everyone. I'm Ellie Westman Chin. I'm the President and CEO of Destination Madison. Um, I just want to start by thanking Angela uh, and the great partnership that we have with her and thanking each of you for your support of Destination Madison. So we know you have a tight agenda, but we did want to just give an update this evening so you can kind of see what we've been doing this year and where we're headed into the rest of the year. I came on board in February of 21. I moved in from Tennessee. And Tennessee completely reopened after closing down in September of 2020. So I had been through a reopening and knew what that felt like, what happened when that, whenever you reopened. When I got here, we were still pretty restricted and we had a lot of mandates. So we took that opportunity as a team to reach out to our partners, to reach out to our municipal partners, our stakeholders, our board, our staff, and said, what are you experiencing? What's the forecast? What are you looking forward to when we reopen? Because we knew when we reopened, we wanted to be ready to go. So the first slide up here is our recovery plan. We kicked this plan off in May, on May 1st of 2021. It just ended at the end of April of 2022. But this is the six um, recovery priorities that came out of all those conversations that we had. So we took all those conversations 
And what we found were themes that came up through each of those conversations. And through that is how we created these six recovery priorities. But basically, we wanted to get sales and marketing back on focus to bringing visitors here. Like every destination in the country, we really pivoted what we were doing to thinking about the local and how can we help our businesses during this time where visitors weren't coming in. Um, we wanted to get our sales plan back up and running again. That's Jamie's department, and he'll jump into that a little bit more. Um, we heard loud and clear we need to get downtown back on its feet because it had a really rough time through the pandemic and through the civil unrest. Um, create and foster through our um, connections through our partners, elevate and embrace the EAI, and then propel the recovery of Madison's tourism industry. So the next slide will give you a pre pretty quick snapshot of how we did on our goals. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple on here. So we wanted to get 1.5 million web website page views. And here, what, this is why that was important, because people weren't even dreaming about vacation. COVID hit, none of us knew what was going on. They weren't thinking, where am I gonna go on vacation? They weren't thinking, someday I wanna go on vacation. They just shut down. So our page views dropped dramatically. We need to get that back, because we know if we can get them on our website, then we can tell them our story of the Madison area, the Dane County area, and then we can get them in here. Um, so the marketing team did a phenomenal job on that, and their, web, their goal was, one. 1.5, they hit 1.9 million website page views. So we're only gonna grow from there moving forward in this year. On the sales side, our goal was 100 leads. And this was a really difficult goal because meeting planners and sports planners really weren't returning our calls at that time because they were still dug into moving their meetings around, having meetings cancel, having attendees not wanting to come. And Jamie and his team did a phenomenal work here where we had 245 leads. We were hoping to book 54,000 room nights and we booked 182,000 room nights. So as you can see, it really got our team, our board, and really our partners understanding where our focus needed to be and got us back in action to what we're supposed to do day in and day out, which is bring visitors into our community. And as I told a group yesterday when I welcomed them to town, I said, we love you being here. Please spend all your money before you go home. And that's what we want them to do. So. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these because we've got some other really important things that we wanna share, but I did wanna give you a highlight of our recovery plan and how we did on that plan. I think, Jamie, it's to you, right? I think you got the next two. Go oh, do I have the next two? Yep. Okay, so where are we today? So two of the metrics that we track, and you've probably heard Angela talk a lot about this, one is hotel occupancy. Day in and day out, how many hotel rooms are booked in our community? And as you can see here, the light pink line was what we were booking in 2020. You can see January and February actually looked pretty good in 2020 because it's before COVID really settled into our community. And then you can see that drop in um, March. The red line is 2021. And that blue line that, that's kind of going up, that's where we are today. So we are making great progress in our hotel occupancy and booking those rooms. Angela is absolutely correct. Leisure travel is leading the charge on recovery right now. And I've been in tourism a long time, and it usually is youth and amateur sports. Leisure doesn't come back as quickly, but what's happened is people haven't traveled for two years. They have $3.2 trillion in funds that they didn't spend because we have been home for two years. So we're trying to get that money spent here in our communities. So while we're getting there, we're not back to 2019 yet. We still are chasing 2019 on this chart. The next chart is this another metric we track, which is ADR, average daily rate. So when you check into a hotel, you've got a rate, like you're paying 189 a night or 199 a night. Um, so this is tracking that ADR because we want that ADR to go back. That's the room tax that's being collected, that's funding visitor services, funding what Angela does, what we do. Um, so once again, while we are making progress, I wanna say in 2019, in March of 2019, um, we were at like $111 on average ADR. This year we're at 105, so we're getting there. We're not back, but we're getting there. Based on our forecast that we just received from the, the company that does this for us is called STR, and we just got our new forecast from them. And I have really great news because when we received our forecast last September, they had us forecasted to get back to 2019 in Q1 of 2024, which that nobody can do that, right? Our hotels need to get back on their feet now. Then we got a new forecast report at the beginning of this year. It forecasted us to get back on our feet to 2019 numbers in October of 2023. Better, still not great. Then we got a new forecast report last week, and if we stay on track to how we are doing, we will get back, we will exceed 2019 numbers in April of 2023. 
So we are being very aggressive. You're gonna hear this when Jamie and Kate give their presentations because we want all of our businesses to get back on their feet as quickly as they can, our hotels and restaurants and attractions and the events that Angela talked about and so forth. So that's kind of a state of the industry. Now I think I turn it to you. Thank you, Ellie. You're welcome. So I'm gonna to touch base on a little context on what we're, our initiatives are for, for this year. On the convention sales and services side, we have focused, um, as Ellie mentioned, on reinvigorating our sales team and getting out, and getting out to events and trade shows. Uh, obviously, we didn't travel at all during the, the pandemic, and we are getting out to more trade shows, investing heavily in those, and meeting clients face-to-face. -face. Uh, we also completed an optimization study at Monona Terrace, which in short, it really looked at the space, spaces inside Monona Terrace that were being utilized more off, most often and which were maybe underutilized. And then we did a whole plan to see uh, what, what we should be going after to maximize the space in there and how we're gonna realign the booking calendar. We've always kind of known what the wheelhouse has been for group sizes there, but we're trying to uh, refine that and then we refined our prospecting to go along into that funnel. And so we're diligently looking at building prospects that increase that. And that's just for that building. Obviously, we're still looking for um, the rest of the area as well and different venues, but it was a good place to start uh, at Monona Terrace to, to see how we can best utilize that and hopefully then push smaller events out to other areas of the community. Uh, we were able to maintain our staff uh, for, on the sales side throughout uh, the pandemic, and we have increased our staff uh, to bring on Samantha Brown, who is going to be looking at smaller groups and then some specialty markets that maybe we haven't um, uh, explored in the past. So we're excited to kind of get her up to speed. She's been with us for seven days now. Uh, and then also we've refreshed our services offerings. Uh, these are how we add extra value to clients on the back once they select Dane County and how we, you know, just different things, make sure we're still relevant, make sure we're doing things that differentiate us from uh, different uh, places they may go and allow us to, to rebook. And then on the front end, we use some of these talking points as sales of like, hey, you know, you're not going to just come to a great place. We're also going to take care of you. So uh, we're in the process of evaluating that and implementing that throughout this year. On the, uh, the Madison Area Sports Commission side, again, same, same philosophy there. Uh, we're getting out, we're seeing people were traveling uh, extensively this year. Uh, we have a lot of events that either we've created or we've, we've won that we need to support. Um, and there's a, the list, as you see, we helped create the Isthmus Bowl, which was in Verona, which is a Division Three bowl game. It was the first in the country, and that went really well. And uh, year two is coming back. Uh, curling, CrossFit, Ironman, um, and then we have the, the Youth Bowling um, State Tournament this year. Uh, on the Youth Grant side, uh, this is our program to get kids into sports. Um, it was largely funded from the Ironman Foundation. Uh, we had talked about it for a long time of like we can't just rely on Ironman to help get kids into to sports and activities. And so uh, with COVID, our, our advisory board said, hey, we really need to get serious about doing stuff. So we started putting in different measures uh, to, to fundraise beyond the Ironman Foundation. Uh, so a couple of things, we've created a quarter of the beer month where we work with different businesses. April it was at the Hop House, so we drove people to the Hop House and they gave us a dollar out off of every Italian Pilsner that was sold, uh, which was called Semester Abroad. Uh, and then we also created a pickleball tournament that will happen uh, this July. Uh, it will start in Sun Prairie. It's, the registration is going really great. Brand Holstein's taking the lead on that. And then we hope that like if we execute it successfully there, we can keep expanding it west, as they say, um, to multiple facilities and, and really grow it. So uh, we're really excited to see how that uh, percolates throughout the community. Uh, and then finally, one of our other committees is the Sports Product Development uh, Committee. Uh, our 2022 initiatives are basically research and and data. So we have a plan in place to collect as much data as possible. There's a lot that's changed within our community, whether it's a school referendum, different venues that have popped up. And so we, we need to refresh what are our gaps from a sporting lens uh, that we need to host. And you know, the, that committee also sees um, a fair amount of 
uh, different ideas that come forth, and we want to be able to provide both to communities and to those people like, hey, this is what the data shows. Uh, so we're collecting data on sports participation trends, and we just uh, sent out an RFP for a feasibility study to identify gaps in, um, in that infrastructure, and then we should be able to unveil that uh, by this end of October, beginning of November, based on those findings. So uh, uh, here's a list of some upcoming events that we have going on, some we've mentioned. Uh, uh, Angela pointed out, uh, and we agree with her, leisure and sports are leading the way, meetings are next, and then corporate is still a, a bit sluggish. So once we round out that, we'll uh, get those ADR and occupancy numbers that we want. Uh, so with that, that completes my thing, and I'm gonna turn it over to Kate, who always has uh, really nice pictures, so I appreciate going before her. <laughs> no pressure. And leaving me with the fast talker to finish out our show. <laughs> Um, I just want to talk through, uh, again, my name is Kate Dalmar, Vice President of Marketing and Brand Strategy, and super excited to tell you a little bit about where we are on the branding and marketing side. We've done a tremendous amount of research over the last six to 12 months to um, continue to evolve our marketing strategy, looking at new target audiences, particularly on the leisure side, because we've talked about that a lot today. Leisure was leading before we move into the B2B space. So we've identified four different target audiences and I'll introduce you to them to today. Active Alex, Lively Logan, Relax Randy, and Progressive PJ. These are just internally based persona names, but you'll see a little bit their mindsets in the beginning. So act or active adventurers, basically the two differences between the two is one has kids, one does not. Our kickback vacationer is more of our retiree, and then our young socially conscious traveler. A tremendous amount of research and data got us to where we're going and how we're, t how we're attracting these audiences. I'll explain a little bit more in a bit, if you want to advance the slide. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, our target market, much like Angela mentioned earlier, in the leisure side is that, uh, that uh, Midwest states, currently looking at only the drive markets. Uh, we are hoping to expand into the direct flight markets as the airlift returns, but the 400 mile drive radius is a bit of an extension for us. We were previously at a four hour drive mile excuse me, four hour drive radius. So it got us into some new markets with our uh, current campaign. We wanna move forward. So what we, we, we launched a very short term recovery campaign to make sure in, as the pandemic, we started to get out of the pandemic, we wanted to get started in front of travelers until we reached a brand campaign. The brand campaign that we just launched two weeks ago, the objective of that campaign is truly just to inspire people to visit Madison. And that is an important part of how we get people. And when I say Madison, of course, we mean the entire Madison and Dane County area and Fitchburg, Verona, Middleton, and so forth. Let me move forward one more. Um, so our True North, if any of you have done any branding work, it's all about what's that one connect, what's that one feeling or one word that you want everything to resonate more for in the branding and marketing you do and connections where we found. We want people to feel connected to our destination, to the people we live here, and obviously connected to themselves. So move forward, there's a short statement I think really sums up the campaign in a nutshell. Connection is everything, yet it's elusive. Connection to ourselves, to our loved ones, and to our world. It simultaneously grounds us, makes us feel free. In Madison, it's how we thrive. We create and foster spaces and experiences for all people to connect, just as you are. Come here to experience the things that make you that this, the things that bring your family and friends together, the things that make you feel like yourself, come here to be welcomed by people who can't wait to connect with you. Especially coming out of the pandemic, that's what we really know everyone's looking for, and we feel like in the Madison area, we can provide that. So if you move forward, I'm gonna introduce the brand campaign at a really high level. I would be happy to dig in a little bit farther, but wanted to keep it short and sweet today. Unmistakably Madison, the strategy of this campaign is truly to illustrate how much you can actually experience in a single day in our destination and highlight the unique to Madison attractions and activities using a timeline concept with corresponding beautiful copy and imagery. One thing we heard time and time again, when people come to our destination, they can truly do a lot in one day. And I think the relationship that we have with downtown Madison to Fitchburg with under 10 minutes, you're in downtown Madison, urban environment, all of a sudden you're on the bike paths, feeling in the countryside. And we wanna bring that experience to our visitors and have them explore all we have to offer. So if you move forward, this is in the, unfortunately the screen does not do its justice, but it gives you an idea of what the campaign imagery looks like. It is this timeline concept, like you're scrolling through a phone, seeing all the things you can do on Destination, highlighting that really proud moment, in this case, a family kayaking, 
3.07 p.m. began promptly referring to your family as adventurous. But it, t it, it paints a picture of what people can do in Madison. This one I love, and I think it truly represents especially what Fitchburg has to offer with these beautiful bike paths. So explain all the things you can do, looking at our active adventurous that I referred to earlier and how they can discover the, co the country's most bikeable city. You're fine, it's perfect. Um, so one thing that's a key strategy to this campaign is, I mean, you're all getting fed marketing messages hundreds of thousands of times a day. So how do we make sure that the, what we're putting out there resonates with our target audiences? The key is delivering the right, the right content to the right person in the right place. So all of those four personas I introduced to you before, we have spent so much time getting to know them, understanding their motivators, understanding what social media they're on, what platforms that they're spending throughout the day, and, and feeding them ads that resonate with their copy and the imagery, and then building them through so they're getting to our website and finding out the right content that resonates with them. So if someone's planning a vacation for them and their family, we're making sure we're providing all that information from the minute they see our ad to the minute they get on their website and obviously once they get on site in our destination. So you can just see a quick sampling of some of the ads that have been done. And in, in, the, in the example of Relax Randy, he, is our he or she is our retiree looking for more of that relaxed laid back vacation. These are just some of the media placements that we've, we've done in this large scale campaign. We've placed um, print advertising in Midwest Living. We're finding Randy where he is on social media, which is Facebook and Instagram. And then obviously where they are on their um, placing ads like Martha Stewart or um, additional websites that the, this persona lives on. Um, we have a great uh, 60 second video we can share with you that is um, on YouTube and Hulu and other channels as well. Moving forward, these are just some of the ads that Active Alex, our um, parent, our Active Explorer, is um, receiving that resonate with them and then the spaces they're on. Again, all of the ads are custom and curated to the uh, persona that's receiving the ad. If you move forward, Lively Logan is our um, millennial, it's similar to Active Alex, our millennial, if you want to put an age on it, um, looking for an uh, active uh, time when they're here, but without kids. They may have children and choosing to not travel with their children or they are single or with friends. It's a little bit of a different plan for their explore exploration. Progressive PJ is our younger, socially conscious traveler, really, really hard to target. If any of you are in the marketing space, um, trying to capture the 20 to 28 year old individual is tough. So we're looking at different ways to um, find Progressive PJ, but we feel like we have a great market to bring that younger audience, progressive audience to Madison area. That's in a nutshell. Lots more information, but we wanted to give you a high-level overview and happy to take questions on the branding or any of the work that we're doing at Destination Madison. Very good. Questions from the committee? Council? Yes, Alder Gerhardt. I'm, I've heard that, uh, that we may not get the CrossFit Games next year, after this year. Is that true, or are we, are we trying to keep them? You want to take it, Jamie? <laughs> Second over here. Or... It doesn't, you can take it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Push. Oh, I gotta push. Don't, don't do it. Go push it. Oh no. <laughs> okay, go. Okay, we did. Uh, they did announce that we are getting the CrossFit Games for 2023. Oh, great. So after that, I would suspect that it will leave our destination, but uh, we do have it for another year. That's great news. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that was a long build-up. <laughs> <laughs> Keep her in suspense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Ironman is the Ironman will be the 20th anniversary this year, so a really celebratory year oh. to bring that event here. It was supposed to be last year, but obviously with the COVID year, we got a different year. Sure. So we're looking forward to that. Go ahead, Alder. I just want to mention too. Um, so for the we were talking about bus routes last night. Lots of problems with the bus system, but um, theoretically, Fish Hatchery Road is going to have 15 minute service all the way down to Hatchery Hill and back. So we got a couple of hotels there. We got restaurants there. And I would love if we could get some of that, those big sports events out to Fitchburg and going in and out on, the, on a quick bus. Um, sounds like a potential opportunity because that, that network should go into effect middle of 2023. So cool. um, anyway, just, just a thought. It'd be great yeah, to get some of those, those people out to Fitchburg. Mayor Richardson. You mentioned Iron Man. I know they talked about doing the half Iron Man on Saturday, the full on Sunday, and I know I've heard concerns about impacts on resources for you know communities like us that have to support some of the, all these events. Is that something they're still planning on? Uh, you take it. 
We are generally concerned about that as well, but yes, that is the, the plan. For us to be able to extend Ironman, that's um, basically what, what we were asked to pull off as a community. Um, so yeah, that's the plan and it's expected to be this year. Okay. All right, and I see no other questions. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate All right, Ellie, Kate, and Jamie, and Angela, thank you very much. We will move on to the uh, next item on our agenda, and that's work, uh, Respectful Workplace Training presentation by CVMIC. And it is a video, and it's, it's being launched right now. All members, good evening. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I am really happy to provide this training and education to all of you. Um, my name is Abby Brown. I represent the Cities and Villages Mutual Insurance Company, your city's um, insurance provider. I work on the HR and employment law side. I work very closely with your HR teams to provide trainings and support as they deem fit. And I'm happy to talk about the topic of creating a respectful workplace with all of you today and really just provide that education um, and background. At the end of the day, our goal is to provide tools so that you have a safe workplace and one that fosters a positive environment. We're gonna talk about things today, like what is illegal harassment? And on the flip side of that, what are behaviors that are just unprofessional? What's the difference between bullying and harassment? And what is really acceptable workplace conduct? At the end of the day, I want us all to really understand the impact that our behavior, our actions have on others. Because again, going back to our main goal of fostering a positive environment where all people um, thrive and feel comfortable in the culture and environment that they are in. There are two laws that protect each of us against any type of discrimination or harassment. And that is, first of all, the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act, which protects all of us against any type of discriminating behavior against employees or job applicants based on age, arrest, conviction record, ancestry or race, disability, honesty testing, sex, sexual orientation, and military status. If you get to the point of hiring someone and they all of a sudden come forward with some information on their military background, you cannot rescind a job offer for fear that someone who has military background may have any type of issues or what we have heard some people say they might be a ticking time bomb. That is completely illegal. Those people are protected against decisions like that. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 also protects all of us against discrimination or harassment based on our membership in any of these protected classes, race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Again, any type of employment action, and we are protected all of us are members of one of these protected classes. What is the difference between bullying and harassment? Bullying occurs when someone commits offensive, intimidating, malicious, or insulting behavior. It certainly hurts our feelings and it can create physical harm as well, depending on what that behavior is. Whereas harassment is illegal when the behavior is directed at one of the protected classes that we just talked about on the previous slide. For example, if I am a shorter individual, if I cannot reach the top of the supply closet and one of my peers is teasing me about not being able to reach that top shelf because I'm short, is that bullying or is that harassment? In this case, it would fall under bullying because being short is not a protected class. Now on the flip side, if I am reaching to the top of the supply closet and one of my peers comes by and starts hooting and hollering about how I'm looking, how my body looks and the jeans I'm wearing that day, that would fall to harassment. Now, how do you know if something is harassment? It is deliberate and it's repeated. 
It's unwelcome, it's not asked for, and it's not returned. And it is one-sided. Now, oftentimes we ask the question, how do you know if something is unwelcome? The best thing that someone can do is tell that person, I don't appreciate that, I don't like that, please stop. Now we know that in many cases, the victim does not feel comfortable saying that. So we have to look for that type of body language and we also just need to be aware of what type of comments and behavior are absolutely illegal and we are not allowed to say them in our work environment. There are three major types of harassment and we're gonna talk through each of these. Hostile work environment, quid pro quo, and harassment by agent or supervisor of the employer, regardless of whether it creates a hostile work environment. So if you are a supervisor, you are considered an agent of your organization and the law holds you to a different standard. Hostile work environment is where harassment is so subjectively and objectively severe and pervasive. It is spreading quickly throughout your work environment that it alters the conditions of an employment potentially, and it creates a really abusive working environment. So things that could be considered a hostile work environment, using sexually suggestive language in the workplace, telling offensive jokes about protected categories of people, making unwanted comments on someone's physical qualities, displaying racist or sexually inappropriate pictures, using slurs or insensitive terms, inappropriate gestures. Those are things that really create that hostile work environment. It makes it difficult for someone to focus on doing their job every day because their work environment is, it feels toxic and abusive. Now, when we can look at what makes a work environment hostile, consideration is given to the frequency and severity of that conduct, whether it is threatening and or humiliating or merely offensive, and whether the harassment unreasonably interferes with that employee's work. Moving on to quid pro quo, this for that. You do something for me and I will do something for you. Or if you don't do something for me, I will do something to you. This normally involves a supervisor and an employee, but it doesn't always. And some examples of how this could apply to a common council, here's some examples. You repair the street before other districts. Otherwise, I will make things very hard for you at public works meetings. You see that this project happens this summer this specific way. Otherwise, I will make sure I am outside every day causing a scene at the location of the work being done. So these are almost types of threats of if you don't do this, something is going to happen to you. Where we see this happening in the work environment, again, typically does happen between a supervisor and an employee. We've seen situations between police officers and field training officers. I can share an example of a male police officer who was training a female FTO. They developed a nice relationship and he ended up asking her out on a date. She declined the date. She simply did not want to be involved with anybody that she works with and he did not take it well. He made sure that she was not going to pass through this program. And luckily someone else within that police department saw what was happening, caught up, and was able to intervene um, on that um, FTO's behalf. They were able to fix that situation, and she was able to move on and eventually, you know, fulfill her dream of becoming a police officer. But these are the types of examples that we see both with Common Council and also just um, in the work environment as well. And lastly, harassment by agent of an organization. Typically, this is a supervisor. And as I mentioned earlier, the threshold of tolerance is lower for anyone who is in a supervisory role. The law says that you should know better. You are the one setting the expectations for your department, for your city. You are the one that people are looking for. And the organization takes on complete responsibility um, for, for that behavior. 
Affirmative defense is also something that we talk about quite often. And I wanna preface this by saying, in no way do I think that anyone deserves any type of harassing or sexually harassing behavior. But what I do wanna share is that the courts would look for an employee to take reasonable care to prevent and correct promptly any sexually harassing behavior. They look, did that employee unreasonably fail to take advantage of preventative or corrective opportunities provided to them or avoid harm otherwise? Now, we absolutely know that in all cases, employees cannot avoid these situations and oftentimes they're caught off guard. However, I can share an example with you of two employees who went to a conference together. In this situation, it did happen to be a male and a female, but it happens in all different types of scenarios as well. These two employees went to a conference together and after the conference they went to the bar. After the bar, while they were sitting there for a while, the male employee asked the female, hey do you want to come back to my hotel room and continue the party? And she said sure. They go back to the male employee's hotel room and while they were there um, he was inappropriate, he attempted to kiss her, she felt uncomfortable and she left. When she got back to the office, she did tell a supervisor about it and just said, I don't want anything to happen. I just want this to be documented. Well, if fast forward a few months later, the same two employees go to a, the, another work trip together. Once again, after that, um, the conference meeting that they were at, they went to the bar and had a few drinks. While they were at the bar, the male employee once again asked that female if she would like to go back to his hotel room. In this situation, the female did go back to that um, male employee's hotel room. And once again, he did attempt to kiss her. She was upset and left again. And in this situation, here's an example of where the courts would look for, did that female employee put herself um, in harm's way again after what had happened the first time? And they would say that that female employee could have avoided the issue for the second time if she would not have gone to have a drink with him or if she would not have gone to the male employee's room. And again, I just wanna close this by saying, by no means does anyone deserve this behavior, but the courts do look for um, these types of preventative measures um, to be taken or for an employee to take advantage of um, any type of uh, corrective opportunities to not to avoid harm when and if possible. Now going back to what is bullying? And really when you think about uh, the difference, the difference between bullying and harassment, bullying is a person commits offensive, intimidating, malicious or insulting behavior that causes a lot of emotional harm and can cause physical harm as well. Things like physical bullying, any type of physical contact where someone is hurt um, or injured, kicking, punching, taking something from someone. Verbal bullying would occur when we see name calling, offensive remarks, or joking. A lot of times we hear, well, I was just joking, right? Now, if it does fall, if those jokes, those comments do fall under any type of um, the protected classes, so again, someone's gender, so socioeconomic status or religion, this also falls into harassment. So this is where we see a very fine line. Indirect bullying exclusion. Oftentimes what we see is spreading rumors or stories about someone, telling something to others that was told to you in private or excluding others from the group. Intimidation, when the bully threatens someone else and frightens that person that they end up doing what that person wants for fear of what might happen. And lastly, cyberbullying. This is something that occurs more and more. Um, and it's things like sending messages, pictures, information through emails, chat, cell phones, social media, right? So someone posting a picture on Facebook, posting comments on their Instagram, their Snapchat, these things make their way back into the work environment especially when there is any type of representation of your city. If they're still wearing the polo with your city's logo, their badge, these types of things um, 
absolutely make their way back into the work environment. When we are representing our city, we have to make sure that we are following this professional behavior and upholding the values that our city has. Now, when we talk about the um, responsibilities that we have in dealing with these types of matters, the best thing that we tell employees is, if comfortable, inform the harasser directly that they don't like that behavior and it needs to stop. That's the best thing that an employee can do. Now, we know that this doesn't always exist because people aren't comfortable saying it or they're so caught off guard that they don't do something in the, in the moment. The next thing that we really recommend employees do is reporting that harassment to the supervisor or management. Taking the right steps to notify someone that something is happening so that they can help and document the, the events of that harassment. Now, the role of a supervisor or the mayor is to provide the policy to employees. All employees acknowledge receipt that they have read and understood what the city's policy is. The supervisor discusses expectations. They set the example for the staff. So when you think about what happens when a supervisor is participating in this behavior, if they laugh at a joke, what does that say to the rest of the staff? Now, if an incident were to take place between a council member and the city staff or, or a resident, um, investigations begin immediately. They are thorough and timely. They're well documented. And the people, um, residents and taxpayers, are the ones to um, have common council removed from position unless there are other criminal charges involved. Um, so that is how things would happen if something is involving a common council member. In general, after an investigation, if it's determined that harassment occurs, the employer takes effective and appropriate disciplinary action. And this, the actions do depend on the severity of the conduct, um, what action took place, how many times has it happened, and different things like um, reprimand, counseling, suspension, or potentially termination, depending on the severity of that situation. Now, in terms of retaliation, it is illegal for an employer to retaliate against any employees who come forward with a concern or any employees who um, participate in an investigation. So if they're pulled in to answer questions about a situation they might have witnessed, they are absolutely protected against any type of adverse employee action. So oftentimes employees will say, you know, they're afraid to come forward for fear of reprimand, for fear of repercussion. Maybe they're not gonna get that pay increase they were hoping or that job that they felt like they were up for next. And again, the law is very clear about protecting any type of retaliation um, for people who come forward with concerns. Now, when we talk about civility and respect, this really goes back to how can we be more civil in our work environment and how can we just respect and understand the impact we have on the person next to us. And it's really important for um, us to have conversations with staff and talk about what it means to have a respectful work environment. You know, it's one thing the law sets the, the standard. They set the floor of expectations, but we can do better than that, right? Our policies, the way that we conduct ourselves, the values that we have in our cities help us to do better than the law to make it a really great work environment. And the definition of civility here is claiming and caring for one's identity, needs, and beliefs without degrading someone else's in the process. And how does incivility impact your bottom line and our work environment? It affects a lot, our performance in a big way. Two out of three of people cut back on work effort when there is incivility happening in the work environment. As we talked about, the fear and the worry that something um, is going to happen again or that negative work environment, 80% of people lose time worrying about what happened and 12% of people will report they left the job because of an uncivil accident incident. Now, we know that nine out of 10 cases actually go unreported. People would rather leave because they don't wanna deal with something. And we certainly don't wanna lose the great people that are a part of um, our city staff, especially with it being incredibly difficult 
to recruit and to fill these positions right now. So we don't wanna lose the great people that we have when we can avoid it by just really having a respectful work environment. Now, the things that we uh, pose to staff and the questions that we just want them to consider is, what if my actions made, made the news? Would I be embarrassed by this? Would this behavior be acceptable if it was said to your mother, to your grandparent, to your spouse? What if this was your daughter or son, right? Is there equal power and participation in this? And really just reflecting on, once again, how does my behavior impact others? Would I be happy if my grandmother saw this post that I put on Facebook? Would I be proud of my son if he posted that? What might I say? And really just challenging ourselves to reflect on those things. Again, I thank you for your time and participation. I thank you for all that you do for your city. And again, really just understanding the impact that we have on others can make it and continue to have the city of Fitchburg to be a wonderful place to work. Thank you. Can I just make one comment on that? I think. Yes, go ahead. You know, to me, the biggest thing that I've seen with uh, you know my time on council is really just respect other people's opinions on things. And I, you know, people have you know, said to me after meetings, you know, I didn't feel, I didn't appreciate people maybe directly feeling, feeling like they were attacked maybe by other people or being told they're a terrible person or how dare you think that. And I think that's the big thing for me is, you know, just making sure they're respecting other people, trying to stay away from you statements because I think that puts people on defense very often where it's, you did this, how could you do that? I mean, keep it more of, I feel this, I feel that. And I think that is probably the biggest area that I see, thankfully it doesn't happen often, but we do sometimes have very um, passionate things that happen in the city, but understanding that we don't, we should, probably shouldn't agree on everything all the time, actually, that'd probably be a problem if we always agreed on everything all the time. There should be some diversity of opinion, but making sure that we're treating with each other with respect, because I've, I've heard that, and thankfully not a lot of occasions, but once in a while. Very good, good points. Additional comments? Very good, all right, thank you. Uh, we will move on to the next topic. Yeah, I just lost my screen. Uh, capital Improvement Plan, CIP process and financial policies. Uh, Misty Dodge, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so this is the annual presentation where we talk about kind of kicking off that CIP process and talk about our financial policies and where we currently stand. Since this is the same group as last year, I left a lot of the material still in there, but my plan is to really skip a lot of it and go to the things that have changed or the new statistics that we have. Uh, so we'll keep going. A lot of that terminology is in here. I did keep the average home tax uh, chart in here. So this is from our adopted budget. Um, so you'll notice from 2010 to 2011, there was a bit of a jump. That was when the library was um, installed. And then you can see from 14 to about 2017, there's a pretty steep swing there too in the average home city taxes. And that was the time when we built those two new fire stations. We had a lot of large road projects and we had a lot of additional public safety personnel that were all hired in that relatively short amount of time. So you can see we're definitely on a trajectory, uh, but we were flat for a while, then did a pretty big spike and now we're kind of going up again. The reason why I like to look at this average home chart is it does account for the market, right? So everybody's house values are going up just as a condition of the, the market going up. Um, but looking at what that average home is, it takes out at least partially that variable. Um, so this is what the, the average home pays. This is that chart from the 2022 budget, the one that I love so much because it talks about where your specific tax dollars go. Uh, so it is also based on that average home. A lot of our stuff is based on that amount. The purple part is the debt service and the capital projects levy. These are the focus of the CIP process that we're gonna be going through. And then the bottom green is the city tax on that average home. You can see from 19 to 20, it was a 2.7%. The year after that, 2.5% increase. And then last year was a 3.2% increase. Um, so pretty close to what my gut says is inflation um, there. 
This is just a chart that shows where we spend our money from our annual report. This is the chart that shows all of the different components of our overall tax levy. So this is all of the amount that, of taxes that we collect for city purposes, all the different kind of buckets that it goes into. Um, but this next chart is the one that takes out uh, the library because that was done by referendum. So I thought that kind of muddies the waters, especially in the beginning years. It takes out the TID because really we want our TID to be contributing more. That means our TIDs are successful and they're doing projects in order to keep going. So having that in that chart is distracting. And then I also removed Fact TV because they are newly on the levy. I also thought that would be a little uh, nuanced too. So this chart here looks at the amount of taxes that we collect for the general city, which is our general operating budget where most of the services that we provide are paid. Uh, it also includes the debt service and it includes the capital projects. And I'll point out to both the debt and the capital projects, this is just the stuff that's paid for by property taxes. Um, so it doesn't account the other debt that we have that's paid by other funding sources. And so if we look at the last 10 years, it's been about a 6.2% increase on average over those 10 years. A general fund in particular uh, was a 4.9% increase average per year debt service 13.2% per year increase, and then capital projects a 9.3% increase. Uh, really what I think that says to me is we have been borrowing a lot more, especially in the last decade or so, and that's because of all these big legacy projects that we have that we're doing. A lot of really large road projects, the two new fire stations, um, a lot of um, what I would call legacy projects. And there's more coming. And really this is, to an extent, what you would expect in a growing community as we're going. So purpose of an annual budget, uh, this is not the process we're about to start, but the process that we'll move into next. So we take all of the costs that we have to spend to provide the level of service that you want to provide. We subtract out all of the other revenues that we receive, and then the difference is that property tax amount. And then we set what that property tax collection is that we will put on the tax bills. Purpose of the CIP, however, that we'll be going into is to look at just those big dollar capital pieces. Um, so to be capital, it's $10,000 individually or 50,000 as a group in, uh, infrequent and a five-year useful life. Uh, and when we're looking at it, remember it's a 10-year look. So there's that front five, which are the more realistic projects. They've been vetted at least to an extent. Staff is kind of starting to seriously think about doing these as they march through the plan. And then there's the back five, which are really what I would call placeholder projects. So they're there to make sure that they're on the radar, that we know that these things are coming, and that there's not too much of an incentive to just push things off the table, right? And to know that those things are coming down the pike and know what your future is going to look like. But as we're talking about the CIP, we'll focus mostly on that front five, and the awareness projects would be in the back. Budget constraints. So this is the part I want to spend the most time on today. Uh, so expenditure restraint program, uh, I know you're all familiar with what that is, uh, but high level, if we qualify for this state program by constraining our expenses, we get a large amount of state aid from the state. The one difference uh, is we did get a transfer of services adjustment for the town of Madison. I had quite a bit of discussion with the DOR about what that adjustment uh, could be and they did really work with us to identify the uniqueness of this unusual thing that we're going through with the town of Madison. So they were very flexible with us at the end of the day. Um, so that being said, I don't expect ERP to be a concern for this CIP, um, but I do think as years move on uh, that that will become more of an issue. And the reason why it's important is it is a relatively large dollar amount. So I did update this chart that shows the history of the ERP aid that we receive. You can see the big jumps are when we got the new library. Our aid almost doubled because our expenses went up so much. We did not qualify with the 2016 budget. That was a choice the council had to make because there were a lot of structural deficits in the year before that they weren't able to address in the following year. And then also two new firefighters. So they decided to exceed that cap for that year and then uh, join back in the program after. Uh, you'll see in 2018, we had a pretty big jump there too. That's because many other municipalities didn't qualify that year. And the expenditure restraint aid is a big pot of money that everybody shares if you qualify. So the more people that fell off, 
the more money that we were able to get in our portion. And then for the 2022 budget, we did end up being able to qualify. Again, thank you to the Department of Revenue for working with us. Um, so I know you guys provided me that flexibility at the, during the budget time to either um, put in a strategy so we didn't lose the capacity or do something different if we were gonna have to skip this year, um, but we were able to qualify. The amount is gonna go down though, because with the TID 6 closure, that reduces um, some of the calculations. So for, with factoring in the TID 6 closure, we'll get about $600,000. When the TID 4 closure happens, it'll drop down to about $500,000. Um, so while it's not as much as we have received recently in that aid, it's still nothing to sneeze at. We still wanna make sure we qualify, because that's you know, half a million dollars that we don't have to collect in property taxes to still do the projects that we wanna do. The bigger one that we are going to have a hard time with is the same as last year in recent years is levy limits. So levy limits is a state statute requirement. It is not something we can choose not to follow. And if we do, for whatever reason, pass a budget that exceeds levy limits, it is a dollar for dollar penalty that the state imposes until that penalty is paid in full. So not only should, can we not or should we not because it's statute, there's also financially they will be made whole if we do. Uh, so that's the biggest constraint that we'll have. The biggest factor in levy limits is the net new construction. So I included a chart uh, based on what our net new construction has been over the past 10 years. Uh, the blue bars are the net new construction. 2023 is just an estimate at this point. That dotted blue line, that is the moving average for the past three years. So you can see our three-year average has been climbing a little bit, which is great. And then that red line is just at 3%. That's where Misty's gut since she was in college was that inflation is 3%. Uh, so that's just kind of the, the benchmark that we use there. So you can see lately we've been exceeding that pretty high, uh, but I don't know that that's necessarily sustainable for the long term. So I think a 3% assumption for a while still is probably reasonable, um, but you can see in 14 and 16, and even in 8, 19, we didn't quite hit that amount. Uh, so we'll wanna make sure we're watching that as we figure out what our levy limits are going to be. It gets harder to hit that every year because we are growing. So 3% is a bigger number every year. Exactly, and then think on too, once we take on the town of Madison, you know, that's adding even more into that denominator that we have to meet. Good point. So this is that seesaw that I walk you through every year. So levy limits. So if we can get that two to 3% net new construction with Misty's assumption on inflation kind of status quo is about two to 3%, that's all we would be able to do. So we have to grow at least that much just to maintain status quo. Frankly, the 3% is probably light this year. We all know the market and CPI and inflation is going kind of crazy. Um, but 3% is kind of that standard. And to Aaron's point, to get to that 2 to 3% for this year, for the 1122 values, which is before the town of Madison, that equates to 82 to $123 million worth of new value. So those are some pretty large projects that would, we would need in order to get to even that inflationary amount. So this year, based on our current estimates, with the caveat that the role is far from complete, we talked about the commercial role last night is uh, in limbo a little bit. They're trying to wrap that up. We also don't have numbers from manufacturing yet at this point. We won't get those till August. Um, but based on our current estimates and what is done, we think we'll get about a 4% net new construction this year, um, which is pretty great. I mean, a lot of my counterparts would be exceptionally jealous of our 4% net new construction. But for us, with as much as we're growing and as much as we want to do, that is going to restrict us. So that about 1% additional amount that we'll get in, in net new construction is the only amount that we'll really have under levy limits to pay for the continued implementation of the town of Madison and then any other growth and service capacity that we want to do. We did add a lot of new positions for the town of Madison with the 2022 budget, but we didn't do everything. We knew we were gonna break it into a couple of chunks, if not multiple chunks. Um, so that's going to be tough to fit all of that in. The bad news I have for you today, as if levy limits wasn't enough, uh, is the 2022 budget. We pre-spent 
what we thought we were gonna get as a levy limit adjustment for the 2023 budget. That was with the TID 6 closure and the Town of Madison absorption. So we, we incorporated those adjustments in our 2022 budget early based on the estimates of what I thought it was going to be at the time. And you can see the original estimate for both of those was about 1.2 million between the two. The revised estimates though is about $800,000. So we, our estimates were off by about 365,000. For the TID closure, the reason there is because it's based on, the estimate that I did was based on last year's numbers and last year's levy, and there were some pretty significant swings in there that I didn't account for. Uh, the other one is the town of Madison dropped 300,000. Uh, when we used it, we assumed that their levy would grow, just like every other communities do, because costs increase. Um, but they decided to use some of their fund balance to artificially reduce the amount of property taxes that they had to collect. And since our levy limit is based on what those parcels paid to the town the last year that they get a town bill, that artificially low amount is what our levy limit adjustment is based on. So that's $300,000 that we need to figure out with the 2023 budget. Misty, I know you and I have talked about this and uh, just for the audience here in the room, that $300,000 reduction in the town of Madison uh, levy that we were hoping to get uh, that's for in perpetuity. Yeah. We will never be able to recover that $300,000 in levy limit adjustment based upon what they had uh, elected to do. And then the other uh, consideration that uh, we'll have to uh, be cognizant of is the fact that because the town taxes uh, were artificially reduced through the use of the fund balance uh, this year, uh, when the Fitch first Fitchburg tax bills show up, they're likely to be a notable increase because of the uh, artificially low number the previous year. So uh, we'll look to do what level of outreach we certainly can do and ensure that there's some information in the tax bill inserts that uh, hopefully identify uh, why that increase is so notable. But uh, just as a heads up, you know, for all of you uh, in the event uh, when those first tax bills show up and you, you get uh, constituent calls, uh, you know, and we'll talk about this in more detail as we get closer, but I think uh, it was great for Misty to bring this up already and allow us to kind of make sure that we, we got this all on your radar. If I can just add, I mean, these are things that you would never guess to put in the agreement 20 years ago, but it's frankly borderline criminal that they did this. I mean, they really hosed us over as a city and doing this just is a huge kick in the teeth. It's really frustrating that they're doing things like this. They've done plenty of other things to really just stick it to us. And it, it, I, I wish there was a way to reverse that. So the reason why I bring it up now is the 2022 budget is set. You know, we already spent a fair amount of it. So of that, what, what we thought was gonna be 1.2, we spent 800,000, which seems like a relatively reasonable amount, knowing there was a bit of a cushion. And then we had planned to use the rest of it in the 2023 CIP in the budget. Uh, but now that 800,000 that we spent in 2022 is nearly the full adjustment that we're going to actually receive. So that $365,000 difference uh, really needs to be absorbed within the CIP. So we do need to start this conversation early because the CIP is gonna look pretty significantly different um, from an opportunity or a funding capacity standpoint than what we thought it would last time. We do still have the TID foreclosure that we know is coming down the pike, hopefully about this time next year. We can do the same strategy where we spend it a year early, uh, though I do have a bit more caution now that we do that because we were a little bit off on the TID 6 closure one as well. I learned some things and how that calculation works and we'd still want to make sure we were cautious with it as we do it. I included a bunch of uh, resources for levy limit information if you're interested. Should I pause here quick before I go into the next section on the adopted policies in case there's questions or more lamenting?
financial policies. So a big part of uh, why we do the things that we do from a financial perspective is to demonstrate our uh, fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayer and also to our bondholders, the people that lend us money for us to do our project, want to make sure they're going to get paid back. And the way that they determine whether or not we're credible is through the Moody's report that we do every year. Uh, so I did update this for the one we received this last fall. Uh, the ratings rationale is pretty much the same as what it was before. Uh, my favorite line is the uh, robust financial position, which serves as a mitigant against the city's limited revenue raising ability. Basically means we are making really strong financial decisions that counteract at least some of that levy limit restrictions that we have to deal with here in Wisconsin that a lot of other states don't have to deal with. Um, so they recognize that that part of it is out of our control, but we're doing the things that we need to do to still be financially strong. Things that could lead to an upgrade would be further expansion of the tax base, having basically a wealthier community, um, and then moderating our debt and our pension and our other fixed costs. And then factors that could lead to a downgrade would be material sustained narrowing of operating reserves, which means you know, spending this money that we've, and these good decisions that we've made in ways that are not responsible, or significantly increasing our leverage. What that means is borrowing more money as that we would then have to pay back. Why is the, uh, to increase the wealthiness of your community, that's, that's a really icky, I don't know, that like strikes me really like as like disgusting. I, I don't know if anyone else feels like that. Did that, what is that about? <laughs> so you have to think about it not through a people lens, but through a numbers lens. And the, the perspective there is if you have a community that can't absorb significant increases in taxes, it's harder for you to pay your debt back where if you have a community that may struggle with a significant increase in taxes, you may be more likely to default, default on your debt and not pay it back. Nope. Yes, uh, Alder Herbs, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Randy. Um, can you comment, I, I'm sorry for my ignorance, but can you elaborate a little more on the, the fixed costs above average? Is it above average to cities our size? Is it above average to Dane County? Uh, what are the, can you elaborate a little more on that? It just it jumped out, it jumped out at me. Absolutely. Uh, so Moody's is a international company. They do this across the globe and across multiple sectors. So they look specifically at governments that are more or less our size. Um, so not just in Wisconsin, but across the United States um, in particular. And the fixed cost that they're talking about would be debt. You know, when you borrow money, you have to pay it back. That is fixed. Uh, that's the biggest one for us. The other one is pension and employee costs. So in general, your staffing levels will stay about the same. You're not likely to do a significant retraction of that. So a lot of those costs are fixed. Uh, here in Wisconsin, we have a fantastic government pension fund, WRS, um, which is one of the best in the countries. Uh, so that helps us in this calculation as well, especially compared to some of our, our comparable municipalities in other states. Um, but that's what they're concerned about, are those costs that we can't really get away from, that they're not discretionary really in any way. It's things that you more or less have to do if you want to continue operating as, your, as a government. Additional questions before we move on? Go ahead, Misty. Uh, financial policies. So we have quite a few financial policies that we use as kind of our guidebook for how we make some of our decisions. Uh, the first one and one that a lot of people uh, focus on is the fund balance within our general fund. Again, our general fund being the primary operating fund for our community. Our policy is between 15 and 25 percent of revenues. Um, but I'll mention that Moody's, again, the the gold standard of doing the right thing from a financial perspective um, says that 30% is what our target should be. Um, and that's important because you want to make sure you have capacity for unexpected events, COVID, uh, cash flow for things that maybe come up that you will get money for later. Uh, a lot of times with our borrowing, we will pay for the costs up front and then borrow at the end of the year. And the reason we can do that is because we have this fund balance available to help us do that cash flow. Um, 
And then as of the end of 2021, we were at 35.7%, uh, which is about where we were last year. This is the chart from the audit presentation last year. Timing is not going in my favor this year, so we didn't have our audit presentation yesterday like originally planned. Um, so I don't have this chart updated for this year, but based on the draft audit report, um, you could, I just put that in as a box over here. Um, so you can see that we are in excess of the, the policy as well as what Moody's target is. Sorry. Uh, so I, I'm always impressed by these by these financial policies and also how we always exceed them, mm -hmm. um, typically by a lot. That's 37% is even an improvement before. I, I just wonder if if the fund balance is part of the strategy to fill that $365,000 gap, is that gonna be, just given the fact that we're so far above even what Moody recommends? Right, uh, so it, it did drop a little from last year, but it, it's still very oh, much I'm so sorry. in excess, yep. So it's at 35.7 now, just in oh. case I misspoke. Um, I, I think to an extent that strategy could be used. I'd be cautious of doing it in certain ways though, because remember, as Chad said, that 300,000 is in perpetuity. That was a base building levy limit adjustment that we lost. We're using fund balance as really a one-time thing that we could do. Um, so I know in the past what we've done is when we built the two new fire stations, we had to buy land. So uh, some, at that point we had used a large amount of our fund balance to buy the land to do those buildings, which then reduced our borrowing costs and reduced how much in interest and such that we had to pay. So that would be a good, one-time use for it. Um, another idea that I've been kicking around in my head is during the 2022 budget, we talked about the uh, body cameras and we used the ARPA or the TID closure money as that one-time next replacement, but then we had the replacement fund set up afterwards. So if we did it in a way that was truly a filling a short-term hole and then we established what we needed to going forward, I think that could be used for the 300,000 that we have to make up for. Um, but I'd be cautious that it's not something that we would become reliant on because we can't rely on spending our fund balance every year. The next financial policy is the tax rate stability. Uh, so this says that we don't want to spend more than $2.25 per $1,000 of equalized value on debt. Uh, the reason why that's important is think of it like your mortgage payment on your home. So you can, you can buy a really big house, but if you can't pay for the mortgage, then it's not a wise financial decision. Uh, we are actually at one point, or $1.10 per thousand EV, uh, which is a great place to be in. Uh, keep in mind though that 2.25 is not a goal. It is an absolute max. Uh, we have bumped into that a few times or been close to with our projections. We also have a lot of big projects coming down still in the next handful of years. So we want to make sure we have enough cushion there um, to not exceed that policy or really even come close to it. You know, the more that we can show that we're within it, the better. Matching revenues and expenses for debt. Uh, this one is mostly uh, matching when we expect we're going to get special assessments that we will then use to pay off the debt and trying to match those payments as much as we can. Uh, the reason why that's important is if we borrow and pay it back too slow, then we're paying more in interest than we needed to. If we pay it back too fast, then we don't have that special assessment re revenue coming in to pay for it. So we want to try to match that as close as possible. And we did meet that this year. Financing capital equipment and road maintenance. Uh, so one of our policies is that we will fund ongoing equipment and road ma roadway maintenance costs from the levy or expenditure restraint funds. Reason why this is important is because if we borrow money for things like these, uh, it means we pay more in the long run between interest and issuance costs, and it's leveraging us more, you know, making more of those fixed costs that we talked about before. Uh, so we are meeting that, so we are borrowing for what I, we call legacy projects, so new buildings, new road extensions or expansions, uh, things like that. And kudos to the council, so 2023 is the last year that we will be borrowing for road maintenance. Um, so this was a long phase out process that we've been doing for over a decade, and we're finally at the end of that, um, which is really great that you guys, as well as all the councils before you, have really committed to that, you know, cash financing our ongoing maintenance, um, which saves us 
or the taxpayers money in the long run because we don't have to pay that interest cost on it. Preservation of geo borrowing capacity. So state statute says that we can't borrow more than 5% of our equalized value. Our policy is 3% and we are within that. Uh, the reason why that's important and why we have a more constrained policy than statute is we need to give ourselves flexibility in case the market crashes. You know, when the bubble happened with the housing market and all the values dropped, uh, we need, if we hadn't had a different policy, we could have violated statute at that point. Uh, also, if there's ever a large unexpected thing that we need to just be able to do, and we need to have that capacity there too. And so as of the end of the year, we were at 1.66% which is 55% of our policy. Number six is the percent of debt expense as a ratio of operating budget. So this talks about how much of our overall operating budget do we wanna spend on principal and interest on our debt payments. And we want it to be within the range of 15 to 25%. Uh, the reason why that's important is we, if it's too high, then it would indicate that we're too leveraged. We're relying too much on debt. For the 2022 budget, we were at 20.9%. And then I did adjust it uh, to count for we had a prepayment of some TID debt in 2022 that we budgeted for, so I backed that out. Um, so accounting for that kind of one-time thing, where our actual ratio should be 20%, which is right within the policy and exactly where we should be. Debt payment and structure. Uh, so this basically talks about how we wanna match how long we pay for our debt compared to how long the asset that we're using to buy it with will last. And then the exception would be, or, and then we wanna focus really on 10 year debt issuance. We don't wanna go too much further than that. Uh, the exception would be TID districts. So those are you know economic development investment tools. So we can go longer for that, uh, but we wanna make sure that we have a project that we know will cash, cash flow whatever it is that we borrow. Uh, so it's important. Uh, the biggest thing that this shows and what the actual number is is how much of a percent of our debt will be paid off in that 10 years. And the reason why that's important is you don't want to have, say, a big balloon payment in year 11 that you then are kicking that can down the road and hoping that it gets figured out or taxes will skyrocket to make that payment. Um, and so as our current actual, based on end of year, is 66.7% in 10 years. So we very much so meet that. Most of our debt uh, for equipment and such like that is 10 years. Some of our roads, our longer roads and our TID stuff can be out to 20 years. But we still try to front load some of it and match it with as we think those TID revenues are going to come in. I kind of talked about this one already, the borrowing for tax incremental finance. This is actually the policy that says that we want to make sure there's a project that we know is going to be able to fully support those debt payments in the TID. And so that's important because if the TID closes and there isn't enough money to pay off the debt, the city alone is responsible for those payments using our taxpayer money. If there's a successful TID and there's extra money, as you know, we split that with everybody, the school district, the county, et cetera, everybody gets that benefit. But if there's a negative, if there's a downfall, that is solely on us and our taxpayers to make up. So we do have a little bit of TID debt still outstanding for TID 4 and TID 6. Those are the two that we're nearing the end on. Uh, both of them, however, are very healthy and successful, and we're prepaying or calling that debt as we're able to under the rules of the debt that we issued. We do have debt for TID 10, which is the North Fish Hatchery Road TID. Uh, at the time that we issued it, we thought that there were going to be projects coming through, uh, but as of this last project, the Ochala building that came through, all of our projections now are that that TID debt will be fully supported with the existing projects. So we still hope there's more great projects coming down to help further vitalize the corridor. But if there aren't, we believe that the TID debt at least will be made whole and the TID will not be underwater. The one that I'm still concerned about a little bit is TID 9, which is the Seminole Lacey TID. There's just a lot of uncertainty there still. So the Sub-Zero Design Building and the Promega Building are both manufacturing facilities. Right now they are being assessed by our assessors. Once they get turned over to manufacturing, 
frankly, it becomes a wild card. So it's somewhere between 50 cents and 60 cents on the dollar that manufacturing assesses versus what we do. So until we get those first values from the state, I have just uncertainty about how this will all work itself out. But we do have those great big projects that are coming through. And the bulk of the TID costs are pay-go, which means that those projects have to pay in in order for us to make those payments. So I have some nervousness about it, but not anything that necessarily keeps me up at night. But we do have some remedies, at least you believe, at least in the back of your mind, that we could use to work through if if it doesn't move in the direction we would like it. Yeah, I think we have a couple options. One is uh, you guys all approved in the CIP to delay some of those projects that we had originally planned to do, which I think was really smart, as opposed to just doing everything right away and hoping it works out. We said, let's do the most important mm -hmm. things now, see where these numbers shake out, and then talk about that kind of second tier of priorities. Uh, so that was a really good proactive thing that we did to help ease some of that uncertainty. The other thing is when the TID closes, if we have another TID that matches the same overlying jurisdictions, meaning it's in the same school district, we could do a donor TID, we could possibly do an extension of a district. Um, those aren't things that I necessarily want to do, but those are tools that we would have in a, in a unfavorable situation. Good, so we're not boxed into a corner completely. Hopefully, as long as the law stays the chain, stays the same sure. too. I mean, that's always the, the wild card. Okay. Mm -hmm. We don't currently have a policy for debt issuance for utilities, uh, but wanted to point out that right, as of right now, all three of our utilities are debt free, which is really a great thing to be proud of. It's what keeps our rates a little bit lower because we don't have that interest cost to be paying back. That being said, in the CIP right now, there are some of those large stormwater projects that may need to be borrowed for in order to fund them. And we also know that our rates in stormwater have gone up pretty significantly recently. So that's something that we're going to have to balance, you know, the, the desire to get these projects done, but also the desire to keep rates reasonable. Go ahead, Alder, Alder Gerhardt. Thanks. Um, the infrastructure bill that was passed federally, you know, obviously, I think we have some money coming for a stormwater project specifically that was allocated by Senator Baldwin, but the that infrastructure package, I assume some of that goes to local governments, or is that, is that is there is there any certainty about the potential for some of that money coming locally? So it's all a grant program. So there's been a variety of grants that we've applied for that are different components of that infrastructure. It's not a bill anymore, it's a law, I guess, the infrastructure law. Yeah. Um, so we've applied for the Purcell and Roman and Grandview projects a couple meetings ago. Um, we've done the, uh, there's another grant, I believe, that we've applied for in that same, same vein. So public work staff and Phil Groupie, our sustainability coordinator um, in particular, have really been staying on top of those grants to see which ones we can apply for. But so far we've been unsuccessful in actually getting awarded any of those grants. We're still early on. I mean, there's a lot of different programs that will continue to be coming out. I hadn't realized that those are, the, that those are from that new law. That was interesting. I just hadn't made that connection. So yeah. it's good to know. Land use and growth policy. This one ultimately says that we want to foster growth in our community um, because that is what helps us relieve the tax burden across the community, but we want it to be in compliance with our master land use plan. Uh, this is important, you know, that larger tax base is more property owners to spread our cost. We also want to keep it in compliance with our land use plan because there's, you know, if we went outside of that, there would be significant infrastructure costs to, to get to those other areas. And so we want to stay compact as we can. And we met that. And then last one is the maintenance and enhancement of our credit rating. So we are currently a AA1, which is something to be very proud of. Uh, not, I guess it's a few decades ago now, but we used to be basically junk bond status. Uh, and we had Ellers come in and help the city. We established these financial policies. We got put on the right path. And all of the council since then have taken that really seriously. So we should be very proud of our AA1. We always want to be better. So there is a AAA uh, rating that we would love to be, and we will continue to work towards that. There's some financial benefit of being AAA. You know, you get a little bit better rate because you're more likely to pay it back, so they're willing to lend it to you with less risk. Um, more so, I think it's just that gold standard to our community and our residents. 
on our taxpayers that say we are making good decisions, we are staying focused on our financial future, and it just is a third party confirmation of our financial responsibility. And what takes us there to a triple, triple A? Yeah, so that was on that Moody's report where we mm -hmm. talked about things that could go to an upgrade. Mm -hmm. So a larger community is really the biggest one that we're running into right now. Right. Though I'll say there is a community in Wisconsin that's about our size or smaller that is a AAA. So we've talked to them in our last presentation. We always ask, you know, what, what do we need to do? Um, that's the one that we don't really have much control over um, but can reach through that point. Um, but then also just furthering furthering our responsibility by meeting these financial policies even more so, demonstrating our responsibility, that type of thing. Good. So those are all of our policies. I included in the presentation those same comparative resources. I think these are great uh, charts that the DOR puts together so you can compare us to other communities in Wisconsin, see how our expenditures compare, how our taxes compare, all of those. Uh, this one I wanted to stop at though, this is a new one, just came out in the last couple of weeks. So this is a chart that shows of our net new construction, again, that primary driver of our levy limit increase, how it's broken out. So the red bar at the bottom is all the commercial. So you can see that's the biggest driver of our net new construction. Uh, that tealish color, well, it's hard to tell on the screen. Uh, the tealish color next up is residential. The orange is manufacturing. So you can see most of our growth has been in commercial and then residential is kind of secondary. I just think that's interesting. So there's a lot of different charts on here uh, that you can do if you are interested in learning more. And you can also compare ourselves to other communities. CIP process and next steps. So the process is essentially the same as what it was last year. So we're taking last year's adopted document. Departments had put in recommendations. The mayor's uh, CIP will be released in early June. We'll go through the amendment process just like last year. We'll have an adopted CIP. And then that will be kind of that starting point for our operating budget. Uh, we will specifically identify anything that changed from the 2022 to 31 adopted CIP during the budget process to the mayor's proposed CIP. We'll point those out specifically in his letter so you know what those changes are, along with if there are any changes from the ARPA and TID closure investment plan, you know, things that are capital that aren't included in the plan, we would point those out specifically as well, just to try to keep that transparent. Uh, there is a step where there's department head presentations. You should all have those on your calendar. It's technically a finance committee meeting, but we hope all of council will join us to learn about those projects and ask questions. It's that information gathering stage. At the next committee of the whole, we will do our financial plan review with Ellers. So that's where they will take all of these policies that we've been talking about and I've been talking about retro like in the past. They'll take them based on the mayor's CIP from this point forward and project out what those policies would look like as well as our levy limits and things like that. Uh, there are no amendments from the floor, just like in past years and our budget process. And then any changes from the adopted CIP when we're done with this in July and the mayor's proposed operating budget in September, any changes between those documents would also be specifically identified for a transparency purposes. We do have some things that we're changing up this year. Uh, so one is there's CIP 3101, which is public works equipment. It used to be all of these departments combined together, highway parks, water, sewer, and stormwater, and we're separating those out just to make it easier to keep track of, and then also easier to update as things are changed. Um, so you'll see that looks a little bit different this year. Wanted to talk a little bit more about the replacement funds, uh, which are also called sinking funds, if that's a term that you're familiar with. Um, so this is the way that the city responds to the replacement of future assets. You know, so we can build something between debt or one-time money, that's a relatively easy thing to do, um, but we have to replace it and operate it and maintain it as we go. And the replacement funds is how we plan for that future replacement. So the mechanics of it are up here in case you're interested, but ultimately we take the value of the asset, divide it by how many years we think it will last, and that's that annualized cost, and then we inflate that by that 3% inflation estimate every year. So that at the end of it, you know, we're accumulating the money that we need to to do that next replacement. 
That's helpful and a good financial planning tool because it evens out the tax levy. So I've got a chart up there that shows if we did the kind of pay-as-you-go strategy as things come due, your levy can be all over the place. And in times like now when we don't have much flexibility, especially within levy limits, that's really hard to manage. Um, so having that more consistent uh, levy is helpful. It also demonstrates what that cost of the future replacement is. Um, so you know, we put something in, you know we need to replace it, and we can demonstrate that we recognize that that's a future obligation that we need to plan for, or future councils will need to address. It also allows for intergeneration, intergenerational equity, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, um, which is a, a way to, to make that more fair for the taxpayers. And then there's also the ability to absorb pluses and minuses. You know, as the market kind of changes and some things come in over, some things kind of come in under, you have just that little bit of cushion that you can work through over the 10, 20 years that these replacement funds are established. So intergenerational equity. So really what that is is that the users of the assets or the taxpayers that are using whatever that asset is, whether it be a plow truck or a park or a road, the users of that asset are the ones that pay for it. So you can do that either through borrowing, you could borrow for it, and then the, new, the future taxpayers are the ones that pay that debt down, or you can do the replacement fund that we're doing, which is the people that are using that original asset will pay for its future replacement. Both of those strategies get you that same goal of intergenerational equity, but the debt option just costs more money. You know, it does the same type of thing, but it has interest costs and issuance costs that have to be absorbed. And then I kind of talked about the commitment to future replacement. So it's, if we borrow for something or we pay for park fees, we still have to operate it and maintain it using our levy. And then if we do park fees for a new project, park fees can't be used to replace it in the future. So that would also have to be absorbed within our levy limits. Last slide. Uh, so the other change that we're making is the special assessment notification letters. So you've probably had constituents that have gotten notice from Public Works that says that there's projects in the CIP that might result in a special assessment to your property. We are planning to continue to send those out, um, but we would like to send it out just for the first five and not the back five. And we've heard from residents that getting it for that back five can be confusing and frustrating because those are placeholder projects. We honestly don't know if they're gonna happen. They're gonna change a bunch of times between now and then, and it just gets frustrating and confusing for the residents. Um, so we'd like to do it just for the front five instead. Those are the projects that we are pretty certain are going to happen, maybe still some tweaks and changes, but pretty close to what's in the plan. Um, so I want to make sure those courtesy notices still go out. The only risk we have with that that I want to be clear about is if there's a project in the back five that all of a sudden gets moved up to year one, uh, that would be, there wouldn't get any courtesy notices for that just in year one. My guess is that that will barely ever happen, if at all, to go from you know, year nine to year one is a pretty significant jump. And if it does, my guess is residents were involved and the property owners were probably involved. Uh, they also will still get notices through the special assessment process that we are required to do. I mean, it would just be this courtesy notice they wouldn't get. So that's our plan at this point, is to do it just for the front five. I guess if there's concerns, reach out to Chad or I, um, and we can talk through it. But that's the plan. Again, goal of being less confusing to the residents. That is it. Questions? Yes, Alder Gerhardt. I'm curious about uh, replacement funds. Is there, I, is this something that a lot of municipalities are doing? Is it a common practice? Because it's interesting because like the interge intergenerational equity is a really interesting concept and I appreciate you being, explaining that all along. But it is sort of, if you're doing replacement financing where like the people now are paying for a future asset versus debt, those future people are paying for the previous. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like opposite. Yep. But, but I mean, I understand that because we're replacing something that's like wearing down over time. I, I can see how you can justify it either way. But I'm curious about like the, how typical it is, it, is it being used in other, or is other municipalities um, like ours? Yeah, so uh, Ellers thinks it's a great idea. So we've talked to them about it before. They've been advocating for it to other municipalities that don't do it. And I'll say some of the other municipalities about our size that I really respect do it as well. Um, a lot of time with the equipment 
piece, they'll have, so what Brookfield in particular does, if they still do, is they have just an amount for equipment, just a flat amount. They don't split it out by department. Mm -hmm. And then they have a separate committee of departments that to get together and figure out how they want to spend it. So it's the same idea. They fill up, fill up the pot with the replacement fund, uh, but then the priorities of how to spend it is up for grabs a little bit more. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Uh, this is not unique by any means. We're not the first ones to do it. It's not a novel concept, um, but every community is different. And then do we invest that money in the meantime to, to get, so I, obviously you want just general interest on that, but it, do we using more, I mean, I guess all of our investments are relatively conservative in nature, but do we ever, because we know the timeline on that equipment replacement, theoretically, I, I just don't know how, I don't know how that's broken out in terms of our, of our uh, investments. Yeah, so we don't track that piece specifically. We do have about $6 million in our WISC fund, which is that long-term, we know we're not going to need this for a long time money, which this replacement fund piece of it would, and fund balance and some of those other things are in that pot, um, which does, should get better rates as we invest it stronger. So not specifically, but indirectly. Okay. Mayor Richardson. Just a quick follow-up. I mean, the replacement fund thing seems like a genius thing and makes a lot of sense and really smart to me. Does Moody's talk about that at all, and do they appreciate that as a strategy? So we, we talk about it, for sure, at Moody's, and we've gotten positive feedback from them. Yep, it won't show up in any of their reports necessarily, um, but they do count that as one of the strong management controls that we have. Okay. So it's Ellers and Moody, the, the experts here are all kind of saying, yeah, keep doing that is what I'm hearing. Yes, yeah. true. Okay. okay. Other other questions? Go ahead, Alder Gerhardt. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I, I can ask you. I, this is more of a curiosity. I'll ask it later. I'm not going to let everyone sit here. <laughs> Thanks. All right. No other questions? We will move on then with the rest of the uh, agenda. Thank you very much, Misty. Of course. CIP comes out June 10th. June 10th. And uh, the document, uh, the presentation uh, will be on the website? Yes. So it's out in the folder on your laptops if you're using city laptops. And then we put it out on the council resources page of the website. Tomorrow we'll do it. Tomorrow. Is the schedule, the schedule will be there as well, if it's not already? Schedule is currently out on the finance department website under the CIP section okay. of our page. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, moving on to announcements. Uh, the next uh, committee of the whole meeting uh, is scheduled for June 22nd, 2022. And do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Motion Second. made by Alder Maldonado and seconded by Alder Gerhardt. Discussion? Hearing none. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Ayes have it. We are adjourned at 8.59 p.m. Thank you.